This is part two of lecture 25, 125D on the Battle of the Kursk Salient. And um, as you know, this is going to accompany volume seven, uh, Communism in Europe, when it appears in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to pick up, uh, pick up where we left off last time. In July of 1943, we know that the heaviest German ammunition expenditure on the Eastern Front up until that point consisted of 236,915 tons consumed. Now this would be critical as the Red High Command launched its counteroffensive at Kursk, which is the subject of our uh, second part of this lecture this morning. On the 12th of July 1943, the Soviets launched Operation Kutuzov, counteroffensive, upon the Krauts from Orel, attacking the flank and rear of Modell's 9th Army. Now Hitler's 12th Panzer Division had been held in reserve. Now, along with the 36th Motorized Infantry, 18th Panzer and 20th Panzer Divisions, it was redeployed to face the Kutuzov spearheads. At 0400 hours on the 5th of July, the German attack commenced with a preliminary bombardment. Manstein's main attack was delivered by Haas Panzer Army and was organized uh, which was organized into densely concentrated spearheads. Opposing the 4th Panzer Army was the Soviet 6th Guards Army, which was composed of the 22nd Guards Rifle Corps and 23rd Guards Rifle Corps. As we have seen, the Reds had three heavily fortified defensive belts to degrade the attacking armored forces. The Voronezh Front headquarters had still to pinpoint the exact location the Krauts would try to break through. Now the Panzer, Panzer Grenadier Division, Group Deutschland, commanded by Walter Horling, was the strongest single division in the 4th Panzer Army, supported on its flanks by the 3rd and 11th Panzer Divisions. A company of 15 Tigers to spearhead the attack had supplemented Group Deutschland's Panzer 3s and 4s. It was they, at dawn on 5 July, backed by heavy artillery support, that advanced on a two-mile front upon the 67th Guards Rifle Division, of the 22nd Guards Rifle Corps. The Panzer Fusilier Regiment, advancing on the left wing, stalled in a minefield when 36 Panthers were blown up. Then a barrage of red anti-tank and artillery fire killed half of them. When a path was cleared, its remnants resumed, their advance toward Gertsovka, where heavy casualties were sustained, continued. Killed was Regimental Commander Colonel Kastitz, south of the village, surrounding the Barasovi stream, the regiment once more bogged down. The Panzer Grenadier Regiment of Grupp Deutschland advancing on the right wing pushed through to the village of Butovo. The tanks were deployed in an arrow formation to minimize the effects of the Soviet pack front defense, with the Tigers leading and the Panzer threes, fours, and assault guns fanning out to the flanks and rear, infantry and combat engineers followed them. Attempts by the Red Air Force VVS to impede the advance were repulsed temporarily by the Luftwaffe. The 3rd Panzer Division, advancing on the left flank of Grupp Deutschland, made progress, but by the end of the day had captured Gertsovka and reached Mikhailovka and stopped. The 17th Infantry Division, on the right flank of the 11th Panzer Division, reached Tereko by the end of the day. By the end of 5 July, a wedge had been created in the first belt of the Soviet defenses. To the east, during the night of 4-5 July, SS combat engineers had infiltrated no man's land and cleared lanes through the Soviet minefields. At dawn on 5 July, the three divisions of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, that is the SS Panzer Grenadier Division, left start Adolf Hitler, the 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Das Reich, and the 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Tottenkopf, attacked the 6th Guards Army's 52nd Guards Rifle Division. These are the best troops the Krauts ever had. They are about to get slaughtered. The main assault was led by a spearhead of 42 Tigers. A total of 594 tanks and assault guns attacked across a seven-mile front. Tottenkopf, the strongest of the three divisions, advanced toward Grimotsky, and screened the right flank. The 1st SS Panzer Grenadier Division advanced on the left flank towards Baikova, and the 2nd Panzer Division 
2nd SS Panzer Division advanced between the two formations in the center. Now, following closely behind the tanks were the SS infantry and combat engineers coming forward to demolish obstacles and clear trenches. This was supported by the Luftwaffe, and that greatly aided in breaking some Soviet strong points and artillery positions, all of which had been anticipated. Now, by 0900 hours, the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had broken through the Soviet first belt of defense along its entire front. At 1300, while pr probing positions between the 1st and 2nd Soviet defensive belts, the 2nd SS Panzer Division's vanguard came under fire from two T-34 tanks, and then 40 more Soviet tanks engaged the division. The 1st Guards Tank Army clashed with the 2nd SS Panzer Division in a four-hour-long battle. The battle had bought enough time for units of the 23rd Soviet Guards Rifle Corps, lodged in the Soviet Second Belt, to prepare itself and be reinforced with additional anti-tank guns. By the early evening, 2nd SS Panzer Division had reached the minefields that marked the outer perimeter of the Soviet Second Belt of Defense. The 1st SS Division had secured Biokovka by 1610. It then pushed forward towards the second belt of defense at Yakov level, but was rebuffed. By the end of the day, the 1st SS Division had sustained 97 dead, 522 wounded, 17 miss missing, and lost 30 tanks. Together with the 2nd SS Panzer Division, it had, however, forced a wedge into the defenses of the 6th Guard Army but only just a wedge into the second uh, line, and there are six of them. Now, the 3rd SS Panzer Division managed to isolate the 155, 155th Guards Regiment of the 52nd Guards Rifle Division of the 23rd Guards Rifle Corps from the rest of its parent division. However, its attempts to sweep the regiment eastward into the flank of the neighboring 375th Rifle Division of the 23rd Guards Rifle Corps failed. That regiment was reinforced by the 96th Tank Brigade. The 2nd SS Panzer Corps requested aid from the 3rd Panzer Corps to its right, but that Panzer Corps had no units to spare. By the end of the day, the 3rd SS Division was blocked by the Donets River. The lack of progress underlined the advance made by its sister divisions and exposed the right flank of the Corps to the Red Army. And meanwhile, the temperature reached 90 degrees Fahrenheit. There were frequent thunderstorms, making fighting difficult. The 6th Guards Army, which confronted the attack by the 48th Panzer Corps and the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, was reinforced with tanks from the 1st Tank Army and the 2nd Guards Tank Corps and the 5th Guards Tank, Ar Tank Corps. The 51st and 90th Guards Rifle Divisions were moved up to the vicinity of Pokrovka, 25 miles to the northeast, in the path of the 1st SS Panzer Division. That's Pokrovka, not Prokhorovka, that we're going to come to in a moment. For those of you that are familiar with the geography, the 93rd Guards Rifle Division was deployed further back along the road leading from Pokrovka to Prokhorovka. Now, facing Army Detachment Kempf, consisting of 3rd Panzer Corps, and Corps Rouse was the 7th Guards Army. It was dug in on the high ground on the eastern bank of the northern Donetsk. The two German corps were ordered to cross the river, breaking through the 7th Guards Army and cover the right flank of the 4th Panzer Army. The Kraut 503rd Heavy Tank Battalion, equipped with 45 tankers, was attached to the 3rd Panzer Corps, specifically a company of 15 tigers attached to each of the Corps' three Panzer Divisions. At the Mikhailovka Bridgehead south of Bulgorod, eight infantry battalions of the 6th Panzer Division crossed the river under heavy red bombardment, and part of the company of Tigers from the 503rd Heavy Tank Battalion crossed before the bridge was destroyed. The rest of the 6th Panzer Division was unable to cross further south due to a traffic jam at the crossing and remained on the western bank of the river throughout the day. Those units of the division that had crossed the river attacked Steri Gorod, but were unable to get through because of minefields and red infantry and artillery fire. 
to the south of the 6th Panzer Division, the 19th Panzer Division, crossed the river but was delayed by mines, moving forward five miles by day's end. The Luftwaffe bombed the bridgehead in a friendly fire incident, wounding the 6th Panzer Division commander and the commander of the 19th Panzer Division. Further south, infantry and tanks of the 7th Panzer Division crossed the river. Then a new bridge had to be built for the Tigers. The 7th Panzer Division eventually broke into the first belt of the Soviet defense and pushed on between Razumno and Krutoy Log, advancing 6.2 miles. The first camp got that day. Operating to the south of the 7th Panzer Division were the 106th Infantry Division and the 320th Infantry Division. Infantry Division of Corps Rao. These two Nazi formations attacked across a 20-mile front without armor support against the 72nd Guards Rifle Division. Corps Rao took the village of Vaslovo Prestani, penetrating the first Red Army defense line. A Soviet counterattack supported by 40 tanks was beaten off with the assistance from artillery and anti-aircraft batteries. Nevertheless, the Corps was whipped having taken 2,000 casualties, so it dug in for the night. On the morning of 6 July 1943, the delaying of Kempf had allowed the Red Army time to prepare their second belt of defense to meet that day's German attack. The 7th Guards Army, which had absorbed the attack of the 3rd Panzer Corps and Corps Rao, was reinforced with two rifle divisions from the reserve. The 15th Guards Rifle Division was moved up to the second belt of defense in the path of the 3rd Panzer Corps. By the evening of 6 July 43, the Voronezh Front had three rifle divisions in reserve under the 69th Army. This was not enough to be certain of containment of the 4th Panzer Army. The 48th Panzer Corps, along the Oboyan axis where the 3rd Defensive Belt was mostly unoccupied, now had only the Red Army 2nd Defensive Belt blocking it from breaking through into the unfortified Soviet rear. To resolve the situation, the Stavka committed strategic reserves to reinforce the Voronezh Front. Specifically, it sent the 5th Guards and 5th Guards Tank Armies, both from the Steppe Front, as well as the 2nd Tank Corps from the Southwestern Front. Stalin had to intervene and call Ivan Konev, ordering his acceptance of this premature piecemeal commitment of the strategic reserve. On the 7th of July 1943, Zhukov ordered the 17th Air Army, his air fleet serving the Southwestern Front, to support the 2nd Air Army in serving the Voronezh Front. And we now are going to have the greatest tank battle in history at Prokhorovka. On July 7th, the 5th Guards Tank Army began advancing to Prokhorovka. 5th Guards Tank Army Commander Lieutenant General Pavel Romistrov described the journey, quote, By midday, the dust rose in thick clouds, settling in a solid layer on roadside bushes, grain fields, tanks, and trucks. The dark red disk of the sun was hardly visible. Tanks, self-propelled guns, artillery tractors, armored personnel carriers, and trucks were advancing in an unending flow. The faces of the soldiers were dark with dust and exhaust fumes. It was intolerably hot. Soldiers were tortured by thirst and their shirts wet with sweat stuck to their bodies." Unquote. The 10th Tank Corps, then still subordinate to the 5th Guards Army, was rushed ahead of the rest of the army, arriving at Prokhorovka that night of 7 July. On the morning of 8 July 1943, the 2nd Tank Corps arrived at Koroka, 25 miles southeast of Prokhorovka. General Batutin ordered a powerful counterattack by the 5th Guards, 2nd Guards, 2nd and 10th Tank Corps. A total of 593 tanks and self-propelled guns supported by most of the front's available air power to defeat the 2nd SS Panzer Corps and expose the right flank of the 48th Panzer Corps. Simultaneously, the 6th Tank Corps was to attract, attack the 48th Panzer Corps and prevent it from breaking through to the Soviet rear. The 10th Tank Corps attack began on the dawn of 8 July and ran straight into the anti-tank anti -tank fire 
of the 2nd and 3rd SS Divisions. That morning, the 5th Guard's Tank Corps attack was repelled by the 3rd SS Division. The 2nd Tank Corps joined in the afternoon and was also repelled. <clears throat> the 2nd Guard's Tank Corps, masked by the forest around the village Gotashevo, 10 miles north of Belgorod, was unknown to the 2nd SS Panzer Corps as it advanced toward the 167th Infantry Divisions. Then Kraut Air found it just before the Red Attack materialized. <clears throat> Fifty Red Tanks were destroyed. The Soviet failed ambush succeeded, however, in stalling the advance of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps that day. By the end of May, July, the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had advanced 18 miles since the start of Citadel had broken through the 1st and 2nd defensive belts. However, slow progress by the 48th Panzer Corps caused Hoff to shift elements of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps to the west to help the 48th Panzer Corps regain its momentum. On the 10th of July, 43, the full corps was on its own forward progress. The direction of their advance now shifted from Obayan, due north, to the northeast toward Prokhorovka. Hoff had discussed this move with Manstein since early May, and it was part of the 4th Panzer Army's plan since the beginning. Now, by this time, however, intelligence told the Stavka to shift reserve formations into its path. The defensive positions were manned by the 2nd Tank Corps, reinforced by the 9th Guards Airborne Division, and the 301st Anti-Tank Artillery Regiment, both from the 33rd, 33rd Guards Rifle Corps. Now, at first, German infantry crossed the river. At this point, Hoth turned the 2nd SS Panzer Corps away from Oboyan to attack toward the northeast in the direction of Prokhorovka. On the 11th of July, 43, Army Detachment Kempf achieved a breakthrough by a surprise night attack when the 6th Panzer Division seized a bridge across the Donetsk River and then it made every effort to push troops and vehicles across the river for an advance on Prokhorovka from the south. Its aim was to link up with the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, encircling the Soviet 9th, 69th Army. Now, throughout 11 July, the 2nd SS Panzer Corps continued its attack toward Prokhorovka, reaching within two miles of that town by that night. During the night of 11 July, Ross Mistroff moved his 5th Guards tank army to an assembly area just behind Prokhorovka in preparation for a massive counterattack the following day. At 0545 in the morning, Kraut Field Headquarters started receiving reports of the sound of tank engines as the Soviets moved into their assembly areas. Soviet artillery and Katyusha regiments were deployed in preparation for the coming counterattack. At 0800 on 12 July 1943, a Soviet artillery barrage began. At 0830, Mistrov radioed his tankers, steel, steel, steel. That was the order to commence the attack. Down off the west slopes before Prokhorovka came the massed armor of five red tank brigades from the Soviet 18th and 29th Tank Corps of the 5th Guards Tank Army. The Soviet tanks advanced down the corridor carrying mounted infantrymen of the 9th Guards Airborne Division on their tanks. To the north and east, the 3rd SS Panzer Division was engaged by the Soviet 33rd Guards Rifle Corps. Tasked with flanking the Soviet defenses around Prokhorovka, the unit first had to beat off a number of attacks before they could go over onto the offensive. Most of the division's tank losses occurred late in the afternoon as they advanced through minefields against well-hidden Soviet anti-tank guns. The 3rd SS reached the kartashova prokhorovka road at the cost of half of its tanks. To the south, the Soviet 18th and 29th Tank Corps was held up by the 1st SS Panzer Division. The Soviet 5 tank brigades drove directly head-to-head -head against Kraut tanks like two bulls crashing into each other without regard to anything but the kill. Red tanks not only drove into the Nazi tanks head-on, they ran over them. An excellent History Channel reproduction of this battle is available on the Internet and at Amazon, entitled Battle of the Kursk Salient, Parts 1 and 2, 
north and south. Meanwhile, the 2nd SS Panzer Division was attacked by the 2nd Tank Corps and the 2nd Guards Tank Corps. Red Air VVS flew deep battle style against the German units on the flanks of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps. The South Soviet counterattack stopped a Nazi breakthrough. On 17 July 1943, Hitler threw in the towel and the 2nd SS Panzer Corps was ordered to end its offensive operations. The strength of the Soviet reserve formations had been greatly underestimated by German intelligence and the Red Army soon went on to the offensive. The result was a battle of attrition for which the Krauts were unprepared and could not win. The end of fascism in the USSR was on the horizon. The Kursk campaign was a strategic Soviet success. The Germans were unable to break through the in-depth Soviet defenses and were caught off guard by the great operational reserves of the Red Army. This result changed the patterns of operations on the Eastern Front, with the Soviet Union gaining the operational initiative. The Soviet Union's larger industrial potential and pool of manpower allowed them to absorb and replenish their losses with their overall strategic strength unaffected. Guderian wrote, quote, With the failure of Citadel, we have suffered a decisive defeat. The armored formations, reformed and re-equipped with so much effort, had lost heavily in both men and equipment and would now be unemployable for a long time to come. It was problematical whether they could be rehabilitated in time to defend the Eastern Front at all. The Soviets exploited their victory to the full. There were to be no more periods of quiet on the Eastern Front, and from now on, the enemy was in undisputed possession of the initiative." Unquote. During Operation Citadel, Luftwaffe units in the area had 27,221 flying sorties with 193 combat losses. Soviet unions, uh, units from the 5th to the 8th of July conducted 11,235 flying sorties with combat losses of 556 aircraft. The Wehrmacht had no strategic reserves, and in the fall of 1943, 25% of Luftwaffe day fighters were on the Eastern Front. With victory, the initiative firmly passed to the Red Army. For the remainder of the war, the Germans reacted to Soviet advances and were never able to regain the initiative. On the 3rd of August, 1943, Red Army Summer Offensive got underway. It was named Operation Hokovodets Rumiansev. It was ordered to destroy the 4th Panzer Army and Army Detachment Kempf and cut off the extended southern portion of New Army Group South. There, diversionary attacks launched two weeks earlier across the Donets and Mayus rivers into the Donbass, Donbass surrounded uh, destroyed Kraut reserves and weakened their defending forces, and that would face the main summer blow. The Red Offensive was initiated by the Voronezh Front and Steppe Fronts against the northern wing of New Army Group South. They drove through the German positions, making broad and deep penetrations. By the 5th of August 1943, the Soviets had liberated Belgorod. By the 12th of August 43, the outskirts of Kharkov had been reached. Kraut 2nd and 3rd SS Panzer Divisions fought a desperate defense. However, the Soviets could not be stopped, and on 23 August 43, Kharkov was liberated. Stalin, throughout the Kursk campaign, trusted the judgment of his commanders and their decisions. Stalin simply oversaw operational planning, only rarely overruling military decisions, because they had gained his confidence and respect. During the Soviet offensive, total casualties amounted to 685,456 men. During Operation Kutuzov, Soviet losses amounted to 112,529 irrecoverable casualties and 317,361 medical casualties for a total loss of 429,890 men. The Western Front reported 25,585 dead and 77,000 wounded. The Bryansk Front suffered 39,000 plus dead and 123,000 plus wounded. The Central Front lost almost 48,000 dead 
and 117,000 wounded. Soviet losses during Operation Hokovodets, Romyantsev, total 255,566 men with 71,611 listed as killed and 183,955 as wounded. The Voronezh Front lost f over 48,000 dead and 109,000 wounded for a total of 157,293. And the Steppe Front lost 23,272 irrecoverable casualties or dead and 75,001 medical casualties or wounded for a total of 98,273. Soviet equipment losses during the German offensive came to 1,614 tanks and self-propelled guns destroyed or damaged of the 3,925 vehicles committed to that battle. During Operation Kutuzov, 2,349 tanks and self-propelled guns were lost out of an initial strength of 2,308. During Polkovodets Romyantsev, 1,864 tanks and self-propelled guns were lost out of the 2,439 employed. However, large Soviet reserves of equipment and their high rate of tank production enabled the Soviet tank armies to soon replace lost equipment and maintain their fighting strength. The Red Army repaired many of its damaged tanks. Many Soviet tanks were rebuilt up to four times to keep them in the fight. Soviet tank strength went up to 2,700 50 tanks by August 3rd due to the repair of damaged vehicles. Soviet Air Force losses during the German offenses, offensive amounted to 677 aircraft on the northern flank and 439 on the southern flank. Total Soviet air losses between 12 July and 18 August were 1,104. Kraut losses during Operation Citadel were 54,182 casualties. Of these, 9,036 were killed, 1,960 missing, and 43,159 wounded. The Ninth Army suffered 23,345 casualties, while the New Army Group South suffered 30,837 casualties. Throughout the Soviet offensives, 111,114 casualties were suffered. In facing Operation Kutuzov, 14,215 men were killed, 11,300 presumed killed or captured, and 61,000 wounded. During Polkovodets Rumiantsev, 25,000 plus casualties were incurred, including nearly 9,000 killed and missing. Total casualties for the three battles were about 50,000 killed or missing and 134,000 wounded. During Operation Citadel, 252 to 323 tanks and assault guns were destroyed. By 5 July, when the Battle of Kursk started, there were 184 operational Panthers. Within two days, this had dropped to 40. On 17 July 43, after Hitler had ordered a stop to the German offensive, Heinz Guderian sent a preliminary assessment of the Panthers. Quote, Due to enemy action and mechanical breakthroughs, the combat strength, sa strength sank rapidly during the first few days. By the evening of 10 July, there were only 10 operational Panthers in the front line. 25 Panthers had been lost as total write-offs. 23 were hit and burnt, and 2 had caught fire during the approach. 100 Panthers were in need of repair. 56 were damaged by hits and mines, 44 by mechanical breakdown. 60% 60 60 of the mechanical breakdowns could be easily repaired. Approximately 40 Panthers had already been repaired and were on their way to the front. About 25 still had not been recovered by the repair service. On the evening of 11 July, 38 Panthers were operational. 31 were total write-offs and 131 were in need of repair. A slow increase in the combat strength is observable. The number of losses by hits, 81 Panthers up to 10 July, attest to the heavy fighting. By 16 July, 43, New Army Group South had lost 161 tanks and 14 assault guns. Ninth Army reported it had lost total write-offs, 41 tanks, 17 assault guns. In total, their losses were 109 Panzer IVs, 42 Panthers, 
38 Panther threes, 31 assault guns, 19 elephants, 10 tigers, and 3 flamethrowing tanks. The number of total write-offs in Panthers was 156, with only 9 operational. Between 600 to 1,600 tank and assault guns sustained damage in the period from 5 July to 18 July. Luftwaffe losses were 618 planes, 159 were lost during the crowd offensive, 218 destroyed during Operation Kutuzov, and a further 147 lost in the Red Counterattack Operation of Polkorodets Rumiantsev. After Hitler gave up on Citadel, the German army lost tanks in combat as well as from abandoning and destroying damaged vehicles. Across the entire front, 50 more Tiger tanks were lost by the end of August, with some 240 damaged. The total number of German tanks and assault guns by the end of August along the entire eastern front was 1,331. And as you can see, that was far outnumbered by what Stalin had available in, in terms of Red, uh, Red Army armor. And that brings us to a conclusion, conclusion of part two of uh, 125 Lecture 125D. In the next lecture, we're going to move on to um, the uh, liberation of Eastern Europe. And then finally, for Volume 7, we're going to deal with the liberation of Berlin. And, uh, and then we'll wrap that up. And I'm going to move on to Volume 8 on uh, the uh, North America prior to white contact.